Hello dear students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Ruchi Bhargav, Assistant Professor in Education, Khalsa College of Education, Ranjit Avenue, Amritsar. Well students, today we will discuss about the topic, history and structure of educational administration during British period. The objectives of the topic are to elucidate the history of educational administration during British period to classify the period of educational administration in British era and to study about the structure of educational administration in British period. Now, first of all, we will discuss the concept of educational administration during British era. Educational administration of the modern type may be stated to have its genesis and development during the British period only. Before the entry of foreign missionaries into India, there had been an indigenous system of education prevalent in the country, covering both elementary and higher education. It was purely a private enterprise, uncontrolled and unconstrained by any kind of external agency. Indigenous education specifically focus on teaching indigenous knowledge, models, methods and content within formal and non-formal educational systems. The growing recognition and use of indigenous education methods can be a response to the erosion and loss of indigenous knowledge through the process of colonization, globalization and modernity. The organization of these institutions had the least resemblance of the present type of educational administration. In the beginning of British period, the education and its administration was in the hands of foreigners for a long time. Later, the demand for the indianization of educational administration has been intensified. Mostly, the policy of alien government was of non-interference and withdrawal from the active participation in educational expansion programs. Hence, private enterprises, both Indian and foreign, had received encouragement by way of grant in aid. Consequently, the machinery of educational administration that had its growth and development during the period has been vested with the controlling and supervisory function mainly. We can classify the development of educational administration during British era in underneath phases. Now, first of all, we will discuss about the early phase of educational administration during British rule, which began in 1757 and lasted till 1812. As in early periods of British rule, they had the tradition to follow laissez-faire policy on non-interference policy. All the schools were administered internally, there being no external control. The parents have to pay for the education of their children. The quality of education offered dependent directly on the amount that the parents themselves paid for the education received no attention from the East India Company as it neither assumed any direct responsibility for educating the children nor they considered education as a part of its administrative structure. The main purpose of East India Company was to flourish their trade. Education was never been their priority. For nearly two centuries of its existence, the East India Company showed 
very little interest in the spread of education in India. Prior to 1772, there were only three institutions maintained by the East India Company and these were concerned with imparting education to the Eurasian children of the company's officers. Fort William College opened in Calcutta soon after 1772 was meant to give education in Indian languages. The Calcutta Madarsa and Sanskrit College first opened in Banaras and later also in Calcutta were designed to provide competent Indian assistance in judicial services. Sanskrit College was set up in 1791 in Banaras and set up by Jonathan Duncan and the purpose was for the study of Hindu law and philosophy. Calcutta Madarsa, which was set up in 1781 in Calcutta by Warren Hastings for the study of Muslim laws and related subjects. At the government level, there was a little chance of developing any kind of educational administration set up during the early period of British rule. Now, we will focus on the second phase of British rule regarding educational administration which began in 1813 and lasted till 1853. This period is termed as a period of provincial line of action because different provinces Bombay, Madras, Bengal, Punjab and Northwestern province were left free to adopt their educational policies. The development of educational administration in India began in 1775 with the efforts of East India Company. It was the modest proposal of Wilforce to send schoolmasters in India but was rejected in the British Parliament in 1793. Now, we will discuss the very important step towards educational administration which was in the form of Charter Act 1813. It was only the Charter of 1813 that East India Company recognized the responsibility for the education of the Indian people. Section 43 of the Charter Act of 1813 declares that a sum not less than 1 lakh rupee in each year shall be set apart and applied to the cause of education. With this declaration, official atmosphere was made to recognize the educational activities in Bengal, Bombay and Madras from 1823 to 1837 and Bengal set up committee of public instruction in 1823 for implementing the Charter Act of 1813. In a resolution dated 17 July 1823, the Governor General Council appointed a general committee of public instruction for the Bengal Presidency. Later, this general committee of public instruction was replaced by another known as the Council of Education, which is the second administrative structure of education initiated in the country by the company. Now, we will focus on Lord Bentick's resolution related with administration of education. Features of Lord William Bentick's resolution of 1835. It was based on Macaulay's minutes passed in the favour of English as medium of instruction. In this resolution, he declared that the assistance towards spread of education would be confined to English schools only and that all the money to be granted would be spent in opening such institutions. In Bombay, the Bombay Native Education Society was doing good work. In 1814, when it was wound up to be replaced by Board of Education, it constructed four district English schools and primary schools, which were of the secondary school standards of present day. Bombay was the first province to introduce systematic administration of education. The history of education in Madras during the period 1823-53 to 53 makes a lawful reading. However, Due to conduction of missionary activities on a, on a very large scale in Madras, English education was imparted more extensively than even in Bombay, where there was an English school in each district of province. In the northwestern province, 
the education institutions were controlled by the government of Bengal up to 1843 when they were transferred to the north western province. During this period, there was a tendency towards centralization of educational administration. Majority of educational institutes were under the control of general department of government of India. Now, we will learn the third phase of educational administration during British period. The third phase which began in 1854 and lasted till 1919. This period is known as the period of extreme centralization. The government of India was concerned with the administration and general policies. They exercised a great influence on the provincial legislation, finances and administration. Provincial governments remained as the agency of central government which were expected to submit proposal for education, legislation before introduction. For previous sanction of government of India, this the province of Punjab was constituted in 1854 and government established a school on modern lines in Amritsar. Now, we will focus on the recommendations of Woods Dispatch. Strictly speaking, a modern system for administration of education was established after Sir Charles Woods Dispatch of 1854. It has been described as a magna carta of the English education in India. The dispatch laid down the foundation stone of the system of administration of education in India. The type of administration for education which he introduced is similar of what we are having today. Now, we will learn the status of educational administration after 1854. By 1854, the Britishers, as they believed, had a firm footing in India. The board of directors therefore accepted the responsibility of educating the people of India and thus came the education dispatch of the board of sections of the East India Company in 1854. In 1857, more and more high and middle schools were opened and attention was given to the primary education department. Department of Education started functioning in all provinces and the grant in aid system was established. Department of Public Instruction were created in 1857 in each of the five provinces that is Bengal, Bombay, Madras and Northwestern province and Punjab. The provincial governments could not even appoint a teacher without sanction from the center. Next came the Act of 1858 related to administration after the massive rebellion of Sepoy 1857. In 1858, the regime of the East India Company ended and the government of the country passed into the hands of the British Crown. Now, an extreme form of centralization was introduced. Then came the guidelines of Lord Mayo in 1870. In 1870, Lord Mayo introduced a system of administration centralization under which general powers of education were transferred to provincial governments with two limitations. First, legislation for universities was centralized as the exclusive concern of the government of India and in most other spheres general powers of supervision removed with the government of India whose sanction was required for all major decisions. Second, expenditure in the education was to be met from revenue assigned for the purpose Thus, while the responsibility for educational policy passed to the provinces, the center still hold important supervisory powers. The exclusive responsibility of the central government for all education in the country changed with the decentralization policy of the government in 1870. Now, we will discuss the Lord Curzon's contribution related to educational administration. In 1899, Lord Curzon 
became the governor general to India and the little interest of center in education turned into deep and sustained interest by the government of India. The Indian Education Commission followed the policy of Education Acts of 1870 and 1876 and recommended that the control of primary education should be transferred to district and municipal boards. But this recommendation was not happy one because this shifting of responsibility to the newly formed boards left them free to experiment with such a vital subject as the education of the people. This commission declared that elementary education of the masses should be considered the first charge in the foster care of the state and that all government secondary schools should be gradually transferred to local native management. The report of Indian Education Commission of 1882-83 to 83 did not directly touch upon the reorganization of a structure of education. By 1882, a new university was opened in Punjab. The total number of colleges by then were 68, of which 38 was run by the government, 18 by the Christian missions, 5 by Indian management and remaining 7 were situated within the state under Indian provinces. In the same year, 1882, the government appointed a commission of 21 members under the chairmanship of Mr. Hunter to inquire the conditions of secondary education in India. The commission recommended that instead of opening more schools under government management, it should be the policy of the government to divert the money towards the encouragement to, of privately managed non-government institutions. To strengthen the machinery for education in the government in India, Lord Curzon was appointed as Director General of Education in 1901 and his chief responsibility was to provide advice to government of India in educational matters and to coordinate the administration of academic affairs of the province. Now, let's focus on recommendations of Indian University Commission. Indian University Commission was set up in 1902 and under its recommendations, a resolution was issued in February 1904. The government of India declared that it cannot consent to divest itself of the responsibility that attach both to its interest and prerogatives. If it is to lend the resource of the state to the support of certain schools, it cannot abrogate its weight to a powerful voice in the determination of the course which is there imparted. In March 1904, another resolution accepted the policy advocated by the Indian Education Commission of 1882 for the progressive devolution of education upon private enterprises. The government of India at the same time recognized the extreme importance of the principle that in each branch of education. The government should maintain a limited number of institutions, both as models of private enterprises to follow and in order to uphold a high standard of education. Under the Indian Act 1904, the schools had to be recognized by the universities. This situation continued till the establishment of separate boards of secondary education and introduction of secondary school leaving examination in the state. A separate department of education was created in the central government in 1910. It was now under the control of a new education member of the executive council of governor general with two secretaries and one assistant secretary. The post of director general was abolished at this stage which was revived in 1915 with a changed designation of education commissioner. In 1910, Lord Minto and Lord Murley took steps to improve the organization of government of India 
and as a result education which was earlier the responsibility of home department in the government was transferred to new department of education. Let us discuss about the contribution of Calcutta University Commission. In 1917 to 1919, the Calcutta University Commission under the chairmanship of Sir Michel Sadler observed that the dividing line between the university and secondary courses should more properly be drawn at the intermediate examination stage than the matriculation and the admission test for universities should be passing of the intermediate examination. The Act of Parliament of 1919 marked the beginning of parliamentary government in India. The provincial governments came to be administered through what is known as diarchy. Under this system, the sphere of activities of a provincial government was divided into two parts the reserve departments and the transfer departments. Under this system, education with some minor exceptions became a provincial and transferred subject in charge of the Indian ministers for the first time. The Government of India Act 1919 introduced a new concept of central responsibility advisory and coordination. Now, we will focus on the final phase in the British era which began in 1920 and lasted till 1947. This stage is called the period of provincial autonomy as there had been comparatively greater devolution of power to the provincial authorities. So, in 1921, because of the dual administration set up in the country, state legislation assemblies and the Ministry of Education came into existence. In the same year, the Central Advisory Board of Education was set up as an instrument for the discharge of the center's advisory functions. The establishment of Inter-University Board in 1924 brought about coordination in the broad outlines of working and courses of studies in the various universities in the country and secured better standards of education to acquire recognition abroad. Now, we will discuss the recommendations of Hartog Committee. In 1929, the Hartog Committee was appointed as a backup to the Indian Statutory Commission to review the position of education in the country. In the opinion of this committee, the matriculation examination of the university still dominated the whole of the secondary course. The committee recommended diversion of more boys to industrial and commercial careers at the end of the middle stage. As a preparation to special instruction in technical and industrial schools, the recommendations of this committee also met more or less the same fate as those of the Calcutta University Commission. So these recommendations could not be implemented. The recommendation was discussed again by the SAPRU committee in 1934. It recommended that the intermediate stage should be abolished and the secondary stage extended by one year. The secondary stage should consist of six years to be divided into two, the higher and the lower, each covering a period of three years. The whole course covering 11 years, five for primary and six for secondary, the general course should be of eight years up to the lower secondary stage. The recommendations of this committee too did not seem to have had much impact except to provide the basis for the diversification of courses later by the Secondary Education Commission. Now, we will focus on the major recommendations of 1935 Act. The Government of India Act 1935 introduced full provincial autonomy in 1937 and this gave greater powers to the Indian education ministers than they had under diarchy. It was for the first time 
therefore that the educational problems begin to be studied from the national point of view a lot of exploratory and experimental work was done with regard to the primary education secondary education adult education vocational and physical education and teachers training etc but not much work could be done with regard to higher education the transfer of control of education from the central government to the provincial governments not only deprived them of the central government's guidance and help but it isolated them from one another the transfer of controls was very helpful to promote education according to the local needs but this boosted provincialism there was now neither any coordinating agency between the provinces and the central government nor among the provinces themselves feeling the need of this coordination and general common policy for the development of a national system of education particularly in the area of higher education central advisory board of education was revived in 1935 in 1936 to 37 two expert advisers abbott and wood were invited to advise the government on certain problems of educational reorganization particularly on problems of vocational education one important result of their recommendations has been that a new type technical institution called the polytechnic has come into existence in some provinces technical commercial and agricultural high schools conducting not literary course were also started the zakir hussain committee in of 1937 was appointed to formulate a scheme of basic education it suggested that the duration of the course of basic education should be of 7 years and education made free for boys and girl from the age of 7 to 14 in conjunction with the wood about report the central advisory board of education discussed the zakir hussain committee report on two occasions the board appointed committees under the chairmanship of bc khair to consider the report in 1939 the second committee gave very careful consideration to the relationship of high schools to basic education and recommended that pupils at the age of 11 plus should on completion of the fifth class in the junior basic primary schools should be diverted either either to senior basic middle or to high schools according to their abilities and aptitudes lastly we will discuss the recommendations of sargent report the john sargent report of 1944 called post war educational development recommended that the intermediate course should be abolished ultimately the whole of this course should be covered in the high school but as an intermediate step the first year of the course should be transferred to the high school and the second to the universities unfortunately the plan was not given a trial with the result that the regeneration of educational system of india has been considerably delayed the department of education which was working as a separate department at the center was combined with the department of health and agriculture to be called the department of education health and agriculture the department was again trifurcated into three separate departments that is department of education department of health and department of agriculture in 1945 In 1947 the department of education was raised to the status of a full fledged ministry of education under the charge of a cabinet minister Maulana Abdul Kalam Azad the ministry was designated differently at different stages according to the volume of work entrusted to it and now it is called the ministry of human resource development to summarize 
This module discusses about history and structure of educational administration during British period. The education system which the British had worked out to consolidate their rule within four decades produce results contrary to their expectations. Many committees were appointed which gave reports for the improvement of education resulting into considerable expansion of educational administrative machinery. The Curzon reforms reflected the fact that necessary changes had to be made corresponding to the needs of the ruling classes. This is only a brief description of official British educational policy in India. The debates in education policy reflected the clash of interest between the British and Indian middle class which was too interested in money and possessions and in being socially respected, while the former attempted to restrict education and impose a control with a view to stop students from taking active part in politics. The latter saw the advantages of expansion of higher education as strengthening the national movement for providing the human resource for the development of capitalism in independent India. Thank you.